Hello, and welcome to the movie trap. I actually very nearly said the film concussion. How, what a throwback that is. Um, That's like way more syllables to add. I know, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, it's a mouthful. Yeah, it's also... Uh, regardless, so that is not... That is not this podcast, but it kind of is. This is a podcast in which uh, the novel idea of three white men talking about movies uh, is introduced. Um, <laughs> introduced. More specifically... <laughs> More specifically, uh, we uh, each pick a movie based around a singular theme, uh, each of us having a certain number of points we can allocate to each movie at the end of each round, which is three episodes based on the three films. We can also gift each other up to three points during those rounds. Uh, and then uh, the winner of each round picks the next theme. Uh, that's more or less the premise of this podcast. Um, that's the cycle of life here. Uh, yeah, that's how we do that's, it. That's, that's pretty much it's it's the chronology of survival. Um, I, I guess before we continue on, I should mention my name is Russell Carlson and the host with the most. Uh, and uh, I, am I am Chris uh, Boroff, the host who's going now. <laughs> yeah. I am Zach Powers, the host with either the second or third most. <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, well, in this case, you have the most, uh, actually, because it's your theme. Um, uh, this, this is the first episode of my right. theme. Mm -hmm. uh, and this particular theme is actors in multiple roles, uh, dual or more. Uh, this particular episode is dual roles. Uh, as we talk about uh, 1988, directed by uh, David Cronenberg, starring Jeremy Irons and Jeremy Irons, it's Dead <laughs> Ringers. Dead Ringers is the topic also, for this particular episode. Also, Genevieve Bajold. Thank you for pronouncing like that. She's That's a gonna be fairly well-known actress at the time. Yeah, yeah, thank you for pronouncing that. Yes. She, I don't she know if Bajold's the actual role, way you uh, say it, but she's very good. <laughs> The dual role is taken by Jeremy Irons playing a set of twins. Um, we have, uh, in fact, to jump right into the plot synopsis, we have uh, Elliot and Beverly Mantle, the Mantle twins, who are uh, a pair of very well-respected gynecologists, uh, twin brothers, uh, who run the premier clinic in... I mean, this movie was filmed in Toronto. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I don't know if it uh, is supposed to be uh, set I, there. I think it's, it's but probably it's definitely okay filmed to say there. it's set in Toronto. I don't see it. I mean, they don't say it. and doesn't really matter where it's set. It sure. could be New York, could be LA. It doesn't really matter. As long as there's rich doctors, am I right? With lots of access to drugs. Um, <laughs> anyway, <Yeah>. sorry. <laughs> At a certain point near the end of the film, you see a restaurant in the background while he's making a phone call. And I looked up the restaurant and it's a Toronto right. state. So it's U. definitely filmed in Toronto. Sorry, that's me making fun of Toronto. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so these two are twins who have been very close since childhood, as twins often are, I would imagine. Um <clears throat> Sometimes I can speak with personal experience. I guess to jump off before we get any further, I myself am an identical twin. So uh, we'll get to that later. Yeah. Uh, they go together to medical school to study gynecology. They introduce at a very young age uh, in undergraduate, in fact, new instruments uh, to serve the gynecological arts, as it were. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's kind of an study. odd. That's kind of an odd moment because it, it wasn't. Uh, so it, it, uh, honestly, in this movie, it does get in more of the art world for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, but there was a weird moment in the beginning, like when they did the ch the the first thing they design in medical school is like a chest spreader, is what it looks like to me. Where it's it, they basically are using it on a cadaver to like spread the chest open. Um, that's I think what that was I, the inspiration, and then they adapt it for. Okay, because that was one of the things where I was a little concerned and freaked out when spoiler they were using it later in the movie on a woman Listen, in such a way that made me very uncomfortable and I was confused because it looked like well, it was just a normal chest spreader I think I think this that is, one was more of a replica like an award that they got you know was, that was yeah. like a yes. gold plated they thing so I don't know if it was actually version. clear for yeah. that was not yeah. meant for use 
but yeah. that's that's later. Uh, I, I, if you are a woman who watches this movie, I imagine it is ten times more terrifying than a man. Like that movie Teeth, I guess, is the closest comparison, mm. uh, which is about a woman mm. with vagina dentata, which is probably more mm. terrifying for a man because there is a certain uh, amount of implied vaginal <laughs> terror. Sure, I mean, I. I I don't know. I can't obviously relate a one to one, but uh, I've got a pretty vivid imagination, so I yeah. imagine well, <laughs> that well, terrified me as well. It's interesting you bring that one up because that is one of the plot points in this film. Actually, is that the uh, the woman that these two men meet is a mutant, uh, for lack of a better term. She has yes, right. So they right, early right, in the right. film meet. An actress, an actress named Claire uh, DeVoe, I believe her last name yeah, is. Yeah, DeVoe. Claire, uh, don't quote me on the mm-hmm. last name. Niveau. Uh And uh, Elliot, uh, she is a patient of theirs. And Elliot is the uh, slightly older brother who is a little more charismatic. He's the PR man for their um, their practice. He wines and dines investors and often women as well. Whereas Beverly seems to be more studious and probably the better gynecologist uh, as a rule. Uh, And so they have a very, uh, I would say, disturbing practice where often Elliot will meet a woman, take her out, sleep with her, and later... uh, he will hand her off, I suppose, to Bev. Uh, Bev, pretending to be Elliot, will come into a second or third date and also have sex with the woman. He even says, if it weren't for me, you'd still be a virgin. Um, yeah, so they have this underhanded, uh, and I would describe it as rape practice <laughs> of deceiving women mm-hmm into having sex with both of them under the pretense that it's just Elliot the whole time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they pull this con on uh, Claire. Who uh, and the, uh, the reason begins that, to... One of the things with Claire and the reason that they meet her is that she meets them attempting to become fertile because she is infertile. And the reason she's Correct. infertile is as they discover, she has a trifurcated cervix which is something that doesn't exist yes. in real life it is an invention of this movie but it basically is that she has three cervixes okay. and uh a cervix that generally leads... has one entrance she has three is the is the is the premise there she's so, a yeah. quote as as she is described later a mutant woman is the phrase they occasionally use uh yeah that's an epithet they, that they throw well, at her later we'll in the film it. yeah yeah. So uh, this switching on Claire uh, continues and Bev begins to have genuine feelings for her. At the same time, Claire begins to notice that her lover, who she assumes is Elliot, is inconsistent in his mood and attitudes and such and such and deduces the reality of what is going on. There's also a couple of telling scenes. In which, like, she mentions Beverly's name being kind of a girl's name. And she thinks she's talking to Elliot and it causes who she thinks is Elliot to kind of, like, frown and really kick his feet up about, oh my god, it's, a, it's, a, it's not spelled like a girl's name, it's spelled like a boy's name. And it's a pretty telling moment that he's not good at maintaining this cover. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and so she insists on having dinner right, with yeah. the both of them. At which point she reveals she fully understands what they are doing to her. She is disgusted by them, but in particular is disgusted by the less sensitive, I would say, uh, uh, more womanizing Elliot and ultimately continues to pursue a relationship with Beverly and exclusively Beverly after, uh, you know, uh, after this tense confrontation. Um. And so uh, Beverly has this relationship with her. She has uh, another quirk of hers is that she abuses prescription medication, something that Beverly himself begins to take on the more time he spends with her. Uh, Eventually, Claire is called away for 10 weeks to do a film shoot. She is an actress, uh, a famous actress, 
and Beverly Canada, Canada famous. famous. <laughs> Canada sure, famous. Canada famous. <laughs> famous enough to be in a movie that would call her away for 10 weeks. And Beverly becomes despondent and becomes more reliant on pills uh, during the time that she is called away. Uh, ultimately spiraling into a pretty severe and noticeable addiction that affects his work in gynecology and affects his relationship with Elliot as well. Yeah, it, um, it felt to me like he was kind of codependent and they kind of they have a flip in the movie exactly. where it's clear that he's codependent with Elliot until this woman gets involved and then he immediately becomes codependent on this woman to the exclusion of his brother and his own well-being when she doesn't really leave him. Uh, but we watch him essentially melt down over the course of yeah, a few weeks she, into she drug and back. insecurities. Yeah, she intends to come back and be with him again after the end of this 10-week period. But he has difficulty accepting that long of a break and becomes increasingly dependent on the pills that Claire introduced him to. Um. His ability to perform his job duties sharply decreases. He shows up drunk at certain PR events and awards um, and starts to He was to even sort of kind of doing back. that before they got really serious because they had kind of that fall down moment. At, like they were getting the the award, the golden plate, the aforementioned award that they got for their device. And Elliot was giving a speech. Beverly kind of in a drunken stupor rage zon about like how I'm the one who does all this stuff. I think that was a little bit right around. That when was a little the, the, the device they got the award for when they were undergraduates or they were recognized for as undergraduates. And then they got an award uh, in the field of gynecology a little later in the movie. OK, where I, I was, uh, where Beverly okay. shows up extraordinarily drunk. OK, Um. Uh, Beverly also begins to have delusions. Um, he calls Claire during, uh, while she's away and another man picks up the phone. It's her assistant or agent. I can't recall exactly. Probably assistant. Yeah. And he, uh, immediately assumes that this man who we later learn is gay and is an assistant is completely, you know, there's nothing there. He immediately assumes that Claire is cheating on him and has moved on past him and becomes more despondent, more drug reliant on drugs. He talks to this man on the phone about how Claire is a mutant and asks if he inspected her closely enough in terms of inspecting her, her cervix. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a, a horrifyingly very, uncomfortable yeah. moment um, because it just sounds yeah. like a drunk toxic man like calling a woman in the middle of the night it's really creepy but it's also but, but, it should be so mentioned to be fair what it's it pretty is cringe that's pretty much what yeah, it yeah. is that's what it is but it's also like i think it's important yeah. to also just point out that this movie being from the 80s it is not the most uh woke so the coding of the man that picks up the phone is heavily gay in a way that we should yeah. be able to immediately yeah. trigger says, on Claire, she says Claire, it. Right. Claire later says he yeah. is. Gay. Yeah. But I yeah. just want to be clear that but, this that the reveal happens and him being gross happens before we actually see uh, her confirm that because we know that's to be true. So it's something where we yeah. plainly are aware that his reaction we know, is. We far as the beyond. audience know. Yeah. We as the audience know this is not an affair beforehand because we see him talking to various studio execs, execs about her costuming in the film she's working on. Right. And all, I mean, like it, it, we watch the audio, we see that guy now and we're like, well, he's totally gay. And that's why, you know, when, when we call it that Beverly's like delusional about this, they don't actually show any him like deluding. It's just the conversation. You just see that. And then he just goes off on this weird tangent about like, you know, you're fucking a mutant, right? You know, that kind yeah. of shit. Um, so it's it's even more off putting for the audience to watch that because you're you're kind of like, wait, what? There's a reasonable explanation for this. You'd way a different level. So Beverly uh, spirals pretty hard, pretty fast. Um, he uh, is treating patients with 
intensely like disregard for their pain or their experiences. He's extremely rude. He uses the gold plated uh, like sort of uh, prototype of the thing they used on a patient even though Elliot says that was never meant for actual medical yeah, use. Yeah, it's a replica. It's yeah. it's just like a replica. And he mocks a woman for uh, her pain while he's examining her and asks her what she was having sex with uh, when she says that she occasionally has intercourse. It's a nightmare scenario uh, for a gynecological visit. And eventually he says, he comes to the conclusion that it's not him that's the problem. It's that he is increasingly working on mutant women and prescribe. Uh, uh, he he, he uh, recruits an artist to create a series of gynecological tools for mutant women. This guy thinking it's just an art installation and Bev intending to use these. And he creates basically like sort of H.R. Giger looking very Cronenberg. Very yeah. Cronenberg. Those I was, you know, I kept waiting for it to happen. I don't know if you already glommed over the the dream that that Beverly has, where he's kind of in between, like uh, Claire is right between him and Elliot in bed, and they're both naked, and they're connected by right. this lump of flesh, basically, right. like Siamese twin. Um, Yes, there's a recurring theme about Siamese twins. The first Siamese yeah, twins, yeah. Uh, Chang Aang. and Aang, yep. who allegedly died when uh, one of the two, uh, who was a drinker and a drug user, died in the night. And upon seeing his brother dead in the morning, the other twin immediately died of fright. Um, so the the idea of Siamese connected twins is recurring, and there are dream sequences where the two are literally connected by by lumps of flesh yeah ropes of flesh yeah and that's why i it, that's where i was like where's the cronenberg in this movie and then i'm like mm -hmm. oh there's the cronenberg well anyway. also the uh so the Beverly... actor the actor who plays the artist who designed those instruments is the guy who played the main character in scanners so it's uh this one canadian actor oh, that no. appears throughout uh cronenberg movies in these little bit scenes and parts he's also in shivers i believe anyway yeah you can keep going zach <laughs> So uh, Elliot is increasingly trying to get Beverly off the drugs, but keeping it as private as possible to maintain their practice and not destroy their careers. But things ultimately begin to fall apart. Beverly goes into a, an operation. He brings his tools, uh, his, his tools that he had recruited to be made. Uh, and the technicians there are terrified. Um, he tries to use one and the patient starts to bleed and he falls over over the patient and starts sucking up the gas, the anesthetic gas that she was using. And that's it. Like the 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 medical board comes down on them. Uh, Elliot goes into the medical board pretending to be Beverly. Um, but to no avail, they see through the charade uh, and functionally their careers are dead, I guess. Their tentative plan is to go into research, but clearly, clearly Elliot never wanted that to happen. And probably Bev didn't either, but in his, his over drugged He's stupor, rationalizing yeah. it. Yeah, he's rationalizing for sure. Yes, he's rationalizing that. Well, that's what we always wanted to do, right? That's what we wanted to do. Right. Yeah, but it's and also, so, I've, I've also uh, heard the, Elliot, the common thing that research is uh, not great for money. It's basically you've become a poor person at that point. For doctors. Oh, yeah. yeah, I believe that. I believe that. Uh, so what at this point, the secret's out. Bev is heavily addicted to various drugs. Uh, he's been seen using needles at this point to get high. Um, and so they, uh, you know, they have this in-home detox situation at first where Elliot tries to detox Beverly. Uh the success of which is mixed at best. Um, he wanders out of the home at one point, uh, tricking the landlord into making him think he's Elliot to get him out of the house. He sees that the guy who created the art display, uh, the, the tools, has made an art display of the tools, breaks in there, steals them, and wanders back to Claire's house, who has recent, she's recently returned to her film shoot, 
uh, absolutely out of his mind, high, uh, and having no idea where he is. She takes care of him and succeeds sort of where Elliot failed in nursing him back to semi-coherence, um, but not understanding what these horrific tools he brought are. And at this point, Beverly almost switches places. He has come to the conclusion that the way to solve this problem is to even himself. Uh, Elliot has come to the conclusion that the best way to solve this problem is even himself out with Bev. So whatever Bev has been taking, he needs to take as well so they can be again on the same wavelength as twins. They need to synchronize. Yeah, it's extremely strange. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, yeah, it's extremely yeah. plain that they're desperately codependent. Elliot, uh, now himself uh, a hopelessly addicted to the same prescription pills that Beverly was previously uh, involved with, begins living in their old, now abandoned office. Uh, it turns seemingly overnight into just the most disgusting possible place. Um, Beverly, mm -hmm. after spending a some amount of time, at least 10 days, at Claire's recovering, uh, is alarmed that he has not heard from Elliot and goes to seek him out, eventually finding him at their old offices, where, again, they formulate this plan that they... He sort of tries to help Elliot recover, but the plan ultimately devolves quickly into they both take the same things at the same time and become clean at the same time. But uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, that does not work. Instead, what happens is <laughs> they become, I don't know, like they're in the depths of, uh, of, of addiction. They're constantly high and out of their minds. And uh, on their birthday, uh, ultimately, Elliot uh, is offers himself up, for lack of a better term, to be executed by means of Bev's horrendous gynecological tools. And Bev sort of disembowels him with uh, a particularly nasty looking number um, and falls asleep afterwards into a drug induced haze, waking up the next morning. Uh, with Elliot's corpse uh, on the stretcher in the background, clearly trying to dissociate the fact of what happened the night before. Um, he wanders outside, it picks up the telephone to call Claire, who asks, who is this? When he says nothing after she picks up, he hangs up, goes back into their office and seemingly dies of either an overdose or withdrawal in his dead brother's arms. And that is, is dead, dead ringers. Um, yep. Real cheery movie. Also, really, strangely, really. right at, it's a real cheery movie, but also strangely at the end when it gets super gory as what um, Zach was describing, it is restrained. That's the weird mm -hmm. thing with this movie. Like you see the horrible tools and you know that he's used them on someone, but they never actually show what they've done. They just have like terrified yes. screams of she's bleeding and then people run off. It's mostly yeah. of the inferences of it that make people really exactly. uncomfortable. And there's no on a lot of just the vaginas straight yeah. up. There's no yeah, right, much yeah. less vag vaginal violence. No, as, as well, it seems like most as, of it's but, like internalized, like harm. It's like seeing the emotions yeah. of the people involved and just how yeah. inhumane they're being to one another is kind of where most and, of the horror and, comes from. And to that note, one of the more one of the more gruesome parts of the whole movie was that dream where she kind of bends over and takes a bite out of that lump of flesh. You know, because it noted when, when Beverly's doing the procedure on Elliot at the end, like they're running through the separation surgery of a Siamese twin. That's what they exactly. think they're doing. They're trying to let each other go so at least one of the two of them can live. Right. That's that's sort of the 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 idea. And then they end up both dying. Um, and, and in Russell's a, dream sequence, just to clarify, yeah, they are connected by a lump of flesh, and Claire is eating through them, and Elliot yeah. is very suspicious of her as a wedge, sort of a Yoko Ono between their relationship. <laughs> Before the, with the purple. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they it, it so to Boris's point that most of the 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 icky wicky of it. 
uh, is internally, and it's all through really emotion. And that, that to your point, one of the most gruesome parts is a dream. Uh, you know, and, and I, I liked about yeah. uh, I liked well, about I was, this movie is that Chris Isaac does, and that are very him. Um, you know, the tool that's very much him. I also liked the red surgery suits. I don't know. If, I mean, like, did they did they still do that back in the eighties? But I don't really care. It, oh yes, yeah, and I, I think it, it worked. I don't know. I think it might have been a stylistic choice. But but when they are in the operating room for people listening, they have these head to toe red. They almost look like the guards in Star Wars that the Emperor has. Yeah. yeah. I, you, I was you going kind of have Catholic a like Cardinals. Well, it kind of feels like when they get into those sequences that these guys have kind of apparently had a very different approach to medicine. Like nothing in their office looks really traditional. So, like, even their, like, normal doctor suits they're wearing walking around the office before they put on the full medical garb, they, <laughs> they don't look like exactly... Space, yeah, right. They, yeah, they're they like space like, suits. Uh, it's like, yeah. it's a whole thing. Yeah, um, and, like, and like, you know, like, Buck Rogers, that kind of shit. That, you know, I, I, that's yeah. a good point. And, well, and that's weird. You, you mentioned it's, like, that Cronenberg stuff. Like, all of his movies have some sort of a doctor or a medical theme in it. Like, I don't know. I think he's actually a doctor, isn't he? I have no I idea. Have no idea. <laughs> No clue. But I, I, I I'm actually not as well versed about idea, David Cronenberg as I should be. Like it sounds like nowadays Dr. Cronenberg would be a character in like American horror story. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's possible um, he's a doctor. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm actually not that familiar. I'm more familiar with Cronenberg's more like recent work, like history of violence and, and that kind of stuff. Um which uh, apparently like I, mm. I, I think uh, enough can't be said you know, about Jeremy Irons who played both Elliot and Beverly. Just, apparently, William. I Hurt. suspect his most famous work I, I, is The Fly, but you know what? I take I it back. It, yeah, probably The Fly. I take it back. He's not a doctor. I am misremembering that. Um, I believe he played a doctor in the movie okay. <laughs> um, that he was in as an actor, which is a really strange choice. And I'm trying to remember the name right now. It was Nightbreed, where he played mm-hmm. Doctor Stephen King at K. Becker. No, no, it was a uh, it was a Clive Barker. It was the crazy Clive Barker, Barker, like like Midian and all that stuff. Uh, Yeah. Anyway, going back briefly. Okay. Russell was going to bring up uh, Jeremy Irons. I I, I just think that uh, Jeremy Irons. I think that like I I think enough kept about his performance in this um, to put where I you're really confused about who's who. I mean, you as the audience have a hard time trying to track I, who's who. It I becomes easier, and, and then towards the end, it really gets difficult. But I, I almost think that was a choice that, yeah. like, them being so interchangeable is sort of the point. Um, you know, and, and apparently, you know, you get two assistants, one paycheck. It's nice. Um, it, it's, it, it, <laughs> it, it, I, I think that's really... And, and then considering the technology that they did in 1988 to make one actor look like two different people wasn't as we take it for granted now but in 1988 that was still pretty cutting edge stuff which why you got to believe that this is a pretty tight production right Borif I mean like there was not walking and shit this was pretty tight um you know when I looked at it I was actually thinking about that same thing because they had to do most of this with traditional like practical effects they couldn't get away with doing it with um computers as much because they just didn't exist So, uh, with that said, there are some kind of interesting things that they use later in movies like Moon that were developed Mm. more in this time period. Like, the, there is one particular shot. Like, this is one of the things that often happens in the movie. If you see the two twins on screen, you almost never see a moving shot unless um, they've carefully planned it out. Like, I think there might be one where they're walking down a hallway... And it's at the very end of the movie when the one brother's dead and the other one's sitting in the other one's lap. Um, And I believe, if I remember correctly, that the technology was basically the same stuff they're using. It was was motion control. So they would just play motion control back twice and then have them in the same spot. But it was the first time some of this had been used in practical photography in this way. So it was really crazy. yeah, uh, that's why I, I, you, you know, it had to be. There was not a lot of bullshit probably on set about like where we're shooting this and from what angle and where Cronenberg could block the actors. I mean, you're pro- you're very, very limited, um, and and Cronenberg does a good job of uh, working within that limitations because I think one of the more striking 
images that it's, it's been a couple of weeks recorded this into this movie has stuck with me. Oh yes, yeah, so we should and say the has is briefly. Um, oh yeah, that <laughs> briefly. <laughs> you are hearing this probably this is our first episode of 2021. We are recording this the day before election day 2020. So, <laughs> so we've got our fingers yeah, yeah, crossed. Yeah. One of us no is Beverly zone. and one of us is Elliot in terms of our <laughs> mental health. <laughs> that it, in that we both end up in a barbiturate habit. Yeah. <laughs> but go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt Russell. Uh, you were talking about but the, the technical. I, I, it's, it's, it, I, I, I've got to say that this movie has stuck with me in, in the interim that we've done this because... It, it, that one image of them kind of going in unison and they're plotting out their schedule for the weekend, you know, kind of this almost death march to the pills, you know, and the camera. And I can yes. tell how they did that because yes. they made yes. them walk in sync. Very, and it's, it, it's just sort of a clamor trick, but I thought it was very cool. They're, they're, they look like identical figure, like they're truly identical in their posture. Like they both have their arms out, having recently just put a needle in their arm. Um, And they're talking about exactly the pills they're going to take over the next few days. And then on Monday morning, they'll start to get clean. Right. Um, And And they're walking through this trashed office. Yeah. And and, and not even just husks of people. You know, they're just kind of trudging along, but in sync, you know, and that's where the limitations of the technology probably had to do that to make that moving shot happen. However, Mm-hmm. It's and it works within the theme of the movie. That shot's great. It's one of the best shots in the whole movie. I think it's inherent in identical twins that there is some dependency issues. Like I think that you're pretty much born with a built-in best friend. One of the things they they give you some some kind of exposition into their childhood, but you never see their parents. I'm guessing their parents weren't all that involved. I'm gonna take a shot in the dark. They, the movie doesn't answer it, nor does it even imply it, and you don't really need it. But I'm just gonna take a guess and say that these kids were left pretty much to their own devices. Um, and so because of that, there's, they've developed this dependency and that dependency is really kind of associated with like this arrested development where you've, you've grown up with this point at this point, you know, and then the, the double edged sword of that is the jealousy, you know, like there is an immediate jealousy between Beverly and Elliot and Elliot a little bit to Beverly because Beverly does most of the work and, and yeah, I think right, should get all the accolades. Uh, I think Beverly is clearly more talented as a doctor and Elliot is clearly a better socializer. He's better with people. And I think both of them, I mean, yeah. Yeah, there's, parts, there's parts of it straight, almost read, yeah. uh, parts of it almost read as though Beverly could be somewhere on the autism scale because he's so yeah. well, specifically distanced from people. But I think that there's also I, I I think that at a certain point they are there's jealousy, but there's also this they they are sharing their individual successes with each other in a very strange way. So obviously, I think the practice is mostly the accomplish of the accomplishment of Beverly. But like there's scenes, there's even a scene, one of the most striking ones, where there's another woman who Elliot has brought home after Claire has left. And they dance with her and Elliot's dancing with her and Beverly is depressed on the couch in a stupor. And he says, dance with us. And like they hold her from both sides and she seems quite into it to to for whatever. Uh, no kink shame. I just I, that yeah. was one of those. That-, that was one of those shots <laughs> where they're dancing where I knew I knew that couldn't be to Jeremy Iron. So I really kind of yeah. felt for the extra who's kind of awkwardly to get it having. Jeremy Irons gently caress his shoulder and he's just sitting there like but looking at his watch also waiting for lunch time. Yeah. <laughs> they're not just holding the woman, they're holding each other. Right. Yeah, it, yeah. That scene, this is an example of a thing where it's like, um, it's it's more the emotional context of stuff than anything shown on screen that makes people uncomfortable in this movie because people do bad things a lot. Um, that scene, we all, all the other scenes, like watching this with my wife, stone cold, watch them, Laughed a couple times. She's like, okay, watching this movie. That scene came up, and I have not seen her squirm this much, going like, ooh, don't touch each other. Gross, don't touch each other. And it was a real thing. I, and I squirmed could, a lot. I could see it happening, I and I was aware of it, and I was like, yeah. That is not, but, uh, that is not, also, my, that, the scene of the operation, the scene of the operation is like, oh boy, that's rough. And actually, that's, a lot of the drug too. addiction stuff was more tough for me. 
Uh, with with the uh, thing you were talking about, with the other actor being uncomfortable in that sequence, it's funny because anytime you see, I remember this from when I was a kid seeing a making of. Anytime they would have both actors doing, uh, like whenever they would have Jeremy Irons playing against the other Jeremy Irons, they would have a stand-in actor who was doing all the lines for that character. So it had to be weird for an actor to go maintain through, eye line. Be, maintain eyeline, maintain like performance and the rest of it and act knowing you're going to be cut out of the movie completely it's like the guy who uh did body work for moff tarkin in like rogue one like he's a he's an actor but you never see that man's face because you only see the like right. creepy cgi mask they put on briefly i want to circle back to something that was very 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 briefly mentioned um jeremy iron's performance in this movie uh russell said that there was like parts where like it was difficult to tell who was who I feel differently like I could always tell when it was Bev and when it was Elliot like I've read uh, some of his some of what he said about performing in this film and he had different points of energy or focus based on which he was playing and even if I spent a moment at the beginning of the scene not totally sure I had a guess and it was always to a T proved correctly like that it was either Bev or Elliot. I thought the for a guy playing two identical twins who are have a lot of similarities. These were I could always tell which character was which I never had trouble. I mean, Jeremy I Irons it, what, is it, really just good. Really, it, at the beginning, it was just funny with him. Like people don't remember how good Jeremy Irons actually is because he's made so many kind of. I'm not. He's had a career mm, that has had ups sure. and downs, similar to Gene hey, Hackman. But I'm he's say really right now, good in this. This man is a British actor, and one thing British actors do is they will be in trash. They don't give one <laughs> flying. They, they, they are happy for Michael they Kane, will answer Michael the phone. Michael Caine will be in Jaws three, my friend. It does That's right. not matter. I, I quote it many times. It's one of my favorite lines he says. I never saw Jaws 3, but I saw the house it paid for. Um, you know, that's that's um and, and so but this was a meaty role for any actor to take, oh. you know? I mean, like, I, I think he originally wanted William Hurt to do it. There were um, two choices. Which, really? William Hurt, uh, I can't remember why William Hurt backed I think down. he had scheduling I think he had scheduling I, uh, yeah. De Niro was approached for this role, Whoa. and he was, like, uncomfortable with the material. Hmm. Hmm. So... Hmm. Yeah. Big tough guy, Bobby De Niro. But I don't uh, think either of them gynecological massacre, huh? <laughs> I don't think either of them would have done a, as good a job as as Jeremy. I Irons don't think did. so, but I do think I do trust Cronenberg with William Hurt. You know, having seen History of Violence, I trust Hernenberg, uh, Cronenberg with performance like that. I tend to agree. I think having somebody with the discipline that Jeremy Irons clearly was, you know exercising on himself to play two different characters because they are different. I mean, like, and I think that was the most off. It was really at the beginning because you kind of jump from when they're kids and then they're grownups. I forgot which one was Beverly, which one was Elliot. I knew they were different people. I just didn't know what their names were. Yeah, I understood. Uh, but I will also say that Jeremy Irons has this, often has this energy of a man who is outwardly extremely proper and presenting all the right displays of like what you want to see in a person, but there seems to be just below the surface, this instability. Mm -hmm. I think most of his famous characters display that trait. And I think that makes him somewhat perfect for this. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I thought, and he nailed it too. Knocked it out of the park. Um, you know, nailed it. I, I, I read that part of the different points of energy is he would put something different in a shoe, whether he was playing Elliot or or, or Beverly. Um, and it's just something that you as an audience member don't need to know that. Like, it's not going to affect you at all, but it's nice to learn that in the craft it mattered to him and therefore it does matter to you. You know, and that's where, you know, I, I thought, you know, for, for a Cronenberg movie, this was a pretty mature film. Um, you know, this was a pretty mature, they, it relied more on, it highlighted the tragedy of the whole thing rather than like the thrills I, of it, you know, like I, the, I should say, I saw this movie ooh, when I was in high school, probably hmm. uh, when I was first discovering Cronenberg, I have not seen it since that point, uh, but I have never, ever, ever, ever forgotten it. And it was, and I think still is maybe my 
favorite Cronenberg movie because I think it is unique in a way. I've seen Videodrome fairly recently, uh, like the last two years. I've seen The Fly, and I think The Fly is a really good movie. Scanners, I think. I like the original better, but that's me. Yeah. Get an scanner, argument for Bring it on. Scanners has a few great effects shot, but I don't think it's actually that great of a movie it's, overall. It's not without its charm, but yeah. yeah. It is slow. This it doesn't is, age well. It's slow. This this movie, I don't forget. Like, the drug... Like, the... the, the it's like... It's, it's around the same time I saw Requiem for a Dream, and it's as oh, wow. influential. <laughs> That's a hell of a double feature. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not the same day, but close to, like, the same age. And okay. in terms of like drug psychosis, it's as memorable for me. And 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 that gynecological terror is just I don't think there's anything in any other Cronenberg movie that I think is quite as scary. Well, and that's, it's interesting uh, that this one has like such an intense um, effect on you just because the only thing in this that really looks like body horror is the one moment in which they're connected to each other or the gynecological instruments themselves but it's funny because that's well, often what people connect me, with Cronenberg they say it's like you know exactly. like naked lunch uh, and things like that or extends sure. call, me, call me a fool for the call me a fool for the idea that uh, the mind can imagine more than the eye can see but I think in this movie that pays off dividends I, I agree completely and then even again it's it shows discipline Russell, what's your favorite Cronenberg movie? History of Violence. Okay. I have not seen that. I'll, that movie's I'll clarify. Awesome. I, I have not actually seen History of Violence. Um, my second favorite, my second favorite, just to bragging rights, would be Scanners, just because, like, it's it's dumb as hell, but I love that movie. I feel like um, I'm going to... And just hams it up I, like he does. I'm kind of the odd man out because I've always really liked Naked Lunch. Mostly because of just I how... I also haven't seen Naked Lunch. I'll, I'll confess... It, it is history of violence and naked have, lunch. I have not seen. Ha, Russell, seen, have you seen naked lunch? I have not. I, I I always refer to the Simpsons joke where I can think two, think two okay. things wrong with the title of that movie. Well, it's as soon as we get a chance, you guys are going to see naked lunch on this because it is it is one of my favorites for uh, a variety of very specific strange reasons. But we'll get into that and later. It's. Uh, I, I think that's probably I think uh, that was Cronenberg's like baby like he wanted to do Naked Lunch like the book it forever uh, it bombed um, it bombed horribly and I have a strong feeling that you guys are going to have a strong reaction to it in one way or another it's it's not really a film you watch and come out of the middle with but yeah well okay. it's a movie that you're gonna pick so yeah right. obviously <laughs> that's <what you're> <laughs> it's definitely like, <laughs> true like you're not gonna pick indiana jones and the last crusade you're gonna pick I've, fucking I've, border. I've, gotta, I've gotta say we we when my wife watched the border episode of this show and zach says in case anybody out there is wanting to watch this movie my wife literally went you know, <laughs> fat, fat chance. <laughs> um, and and she probably, I don't know if she probably would watch this movie just because it it a it, it's it's in the eighties, so the pacing is very still very much of yeah. it, it's trying to be an eighties Hollywood movie, um, because that's this is Toronto trying to butt into that market, so it, it was really kind of their this was supposed to be their prestige piece, and it, and for what it's worth, I think it's really good, but it it. It's still very it's time of the 80s and, you know, like even the architecture. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I know uh, that, that they're still kind of rich yuppies, but, you know. I, I won't pretend by any measure that this is necessarily a perfect movie. I think the performance is not just Jeremy Irons, but the woman who plays Claire, who I regrettably do not have her name in front of me right now. It um, is Genevieve uh, Bajold. Does an excellent job as well. I think the performances in this are so strong. I think the images of like, I, like I said before, I think the images of drug abuse are as strong as Requiem for a Dream in some ways. I think the, the codependence, the restraint on Cronenberg's like typical body horror, but like the implication of that absolute tension and terror. Like I saw this movie at a younger age than I, you know, I, I saw this movie at 14 or 15 and I've never forgotten it. This is the first time I've seen it since then half my life ago. And I, uh, you know, 
part of the reason I picked it is because I was like, I saw that movie when I was so young and I never, ever, ever forgot it. Well, and I, I've always known you're a big booster of, of Jeremy Irons. Um, you know, I also I, love that, him as an actor. Yeah, um, I saw him live uh, in London when I was a senior in high school uh, in a one man show. This, which wow. Was a treat. What was For, the show? And Scar is my favorite Disney villain when I was a child. <laughs> What, what was the show? Um, Out of uh, it curiosity. was called Embers. It was called Embers. Okay. It was about a man who, uh, I believe his wife was having an affair or something, and he had a jealous vendetta against another man. But it was there's, it was technically not a one-man show. There's like two scenes where he briefly interacts with other actors, but it's almost entirely just him. Okay. Well, well, and, and it clearly, even in this movie, he's comfortable doing a lot of heavy lifting um, because, they, you know, he's basically playing. I, I like that they I, I read in the IMDb page that they eventually they, they at first he wanted two trailers, one for Elliot and one for Beverly. But then he decided, I, you know what? I'm way too confused. I have to <laughs> just give me one place to fuck go to, um, which that's good, you know, because Marlon Brando would want to. He would totally want to gigantic ones if he was playing two characters if he could have that range but he doesn't <clears throat> anyway uh, <laughs> I, I, I think for I, I actually it, it, this might take the place of my favorite Cronenberg movie having seen it now because I've never seen this movie before not just for like the, the, the sort of hit close to home with the twin thing where I really it really resonated with me um, because I really understood that dependency that like and I think it's hard to convey that to non twins you know uh, my joke all the time is everybody asks you, what's it like being a twin? And my answer has to be, I don't know what it's like to not be a twin. So you tell me, um, you know, like it's, 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 but even that it does a good job of, I'll say, I mean, it, this is an extreme version of it, you know, of like the dependency issues and the jealousy and the arrest of development and that kind of stuff. This is obviously yeah. a very, very extreme version of it. But the fact is- that it uses that extreme to even highlight something that I think even closely really rings true because you know most of the time for twin stuff they they i i honestly thought when i heard twin stuff cronenberg i thought twin serial killers that's that's where my brain went and that's but it, you know it it knowing cronenberg like he does he does lean against uh he does lean against my expectations most of the time yeah this is a movie that i think just for our listeners who haven't seen it and if you've listened this part this far you already know um there is a chance you will enjoy this movie a lot, but there are so many content warnings that go along with this thing. Like it's not. And even if, even if you are able to get over those, I would not describe it as a pleasant viewing experience. Yeah. It's no, pretty it's raw in movie. terms of it's, what it's it a act, tough movie. Yeah. The things that it actually talks about and the content it talks about are raw. They're very kind of on the surface points. There's another uh, filmmaker who does similar work to this, Adam McGoyan, who will occasionally throw in um, very troubling character flaws. And uh, it's really a fascinating character study to kind of see these uh, people are doing pretty horrendous and horrific things, but from a very humanist standpoint where it doesn't seem like they are playing a... Uh, like a villainous puppet there's you know a deep like they don't have an evil twin and a good twin they're both like characters that are deeply flawed in their own specific ways and wind up echoing into each other in a way that like sort of as a destructive wave that kind of ruins both of their lives can i ask a okay so this i i know there was a certain movie that you guys watched before i joined the previous iteration of this podcast, the film concussion Uh uh, that was about a couple of people who were quite disturbed doing disturbing things. (laughs) And I suspect Russell liked this movie much less and I was wondering it if there was funny any over games, was it? Because I fucking I was hated thinking of movie. funny games. I've never seen okay, yeah, funny games. I, oh, well, do do yourself a favor and just don't. I either <laughs> one. That movie's so good he had to make it twice exactly the same. Um that's a movie <laughs> that's me. so bad that fucking I had movie. to maintain a poker face the entire time we were doing the episode, so there would be an argument as opposed to both of us just talking about how terrible the movie okay. was the entire time. I know I know I, that movie right. has genuine boosters. Like I, I think this Oh yeah. I think this yeah. movie, Dead Riggers, uh, is yeah. kind of forgotten in some ways that's um, true kind of, it yeah. came out in 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 cronenberg when he was in his prime you know cronenberg yeah. when this is right after the fly you know scanners and then naked lunch was right after this so this is kind of like cronenberg 
really when it, he's going on all cylinders also, here in the 80s. This one, I think, also had specifically bad marketing that confused the point of the film to most home I'm audiences. Because sure. this came out kind of close to the time period when erotic thrillers... How do you as a, this thing? Well, it came I out know. at the same time as like erotic thrillers. So the thing is, is I think that... Like Basic some, Instinct and... That, well, that was a couple years later, but this was like right there with like the Postman Always okay. Rings Twice and like Body Heat and this throwback to like noir, hmm. like neo-noir stuff. The thing is, is that when they marketed it, I remember this as a kid thinking, is this like an erotic thriller? And then I watched it and I'm like, this movie is not sexy. And it's obviously not no. sexy and it's really disturbing, it's but sexy. there wasn't... There was no... In, it's no, very strange. Yeah, this, I don't know who the marketing was aiming this before, movie at and i still don't know who the audience for this movie is even though we all like it th- th- this that's a good question the only way to market this movie in 1988 it was impossible now maybe a24 could do it well i mean now you could market mm-hmm. it like using like you know the the modern marketing skills like you can find a platform and yeah. a demographic now and you can aim it at anybody but they were aiming this See, at the general yeah. movie going just, public of 1988 like they were gonna freak out when they saw this. I think like Die Hard was yeah. like you know this was playing in the same theaters as Die Hard. You know year. what I mean? It was the same year, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, audiences what a double different feature that was. Experience. Who knew that yeah. Bev and Elliot would be fighting John McClane in just a few short <laughs> years? <That's right. laughs> they have a other little brother. Alan Rickman is their little brother. Oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, but oh, it's funny Alan that you Rickman would have killed this role too. By the way. Oh, I yeah. Know Alan Rick for sure. Um, but speaking of people who uh of trying to do this movie today. And somebody who is not Jeremy Irons playing this, they are. Amazon did commission a TV show that is supposed to be a remake. Oh, starring, right. Starring Rachel Who's doing Wise. It? As, Who's as doing the, that? Rachel Who's, Wise. They, they, no, no, Rachel, Rachel Wise. Wise. I don't Who's know. The, I don't know who. Ah. Uh, because uh, I was know. going to ask. I, Amazon, I, it up, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I was one to bring this up. I doubt Cronenberg. I, I doubt Cronenberg's involved. I really strongly doubt Cronenberg's involved. I can't believe they commissioned this movie. I, I guess there's somebody out there like me who saw this. It's an interesting choice to make it a female. It might be a strong choice. I think I think for the modern age, it's the right choice. Yeah. Especially I, if I, the gynecological I, stuff persists. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's and, just and very... I don't know. I don't know how it'll work as a, as a miniseries to stretch it out that long. I, oh, I, I, you certainly would be boy. able to get like Elliot's addiction more now because Gentlemen. in the movie, they really rush through Elliot's descent into addiction. He really G- takes gentlemen. like three um, minutes to become yeah, absolutely I, deranged on drugs. Sorry. I just realized that what you guys actually talked about, it's extremely exciting. Um, I don't know if you guys realize who, do you guys who know who the Soska sisters are? Mm-mm. No? Uh, okay. It sounds vaguely familiar. Here's, here's the thing. Sorry. I was going to bring this up in my final thoughts, but when you guys said there's a remake happening, I very quickly Googled it. And I believe the remake is being made by the Soska sisters. Um, the reason this is a big deal is that the Soska sisters are independent horror film twins that have been making independent horror films for a number of years. And they made a film ah. called American Mary, which is a very oh, high quality uh, Canadian. Catherine Isabel. Isabel. It's a very high quality Canadian horror film, a horror thriller that is heavily, heavily borrowing from Cronenberg and from Dead Ringers. So the fact that they are now doing that is kind of fascinating if they're so involved. The the article I just saw was from March 15th to 2019. Um, it, it only got greenlit yeah. in August of 2020. So it's it, it'll be a while before anybody hears hide nor hair of it. But that's yeah. exciting. That at least that 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 kind of I, I I'm wondered, looking forward to it. Personally. Yeah. Now I think that that might work out, especially because Rachel Weisz is a fine actress. You do just fine. Yeah. I yeah. Think. Oh, she's great. I do wonder about the pacing to to prolong it as a TV show to make it. I mean, the movie's kind of long anyway. Well, it's like I think two the plot hours. will be different. I think so too. Yeah. I suspect the plot will be different. I think, I think honestly the, the plot by itself does not demand the runtime this movie has. Mm-hmm. It's mostly about the tension and the theming and just this feeling of discomfort. Uh, but the plot itself is, as long as it took us to run through it, pretty straightforward. It's short. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know yeah. I mean? And, and yeah. It, it spends a lot of time being in this kind of, you know, you, you're watching Beverly's kind of descent into this paranoid, um, drug induced, you know, frenzy most of the time. And it's um, like, he and then, like I said, Elliot they kind of rush through movie. Elliot's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, supposedly yeah. this is based off yeah, like also, two I mean, like, haven't sources. they heard of just weed? <laughs> I mean, that would have been better, mm. but I, I also noticed that during the 80s, like, pill popping was a super common <laughs> thing to talk about. Um, sure. So this was like oh, a common I'll bet it was prevalent in the medical community, too. I'll bet yeah. it, because they, it was so readily available. I'll well, bet, and they knew right where to go. You well, know, there's I'll a, bet it was, I'll bet, you know. One of the funny things with this, there's two things with this. Uh, you're talking about it. It's based off two sources. There's, I guess, um, Stuart and Cyril Marcus were twins. Um, and it's a highly fictionalized version of their story and another novel called Twins by Barry Wood and Jack Giesland. I haven't read those. But since you guys were talking mm. about the pills, that reminded me there is a beat in this that you guys might not have uh, had the same knee-jerk reaction to that I did when I was a kid. This happened in the height, height of the um, need to wear a condom and be protective during sex period because oh, the AIDS, AIDS epidemic, epidemic really had blown bad up. Back then. So in all the scenes where she's saying, I want to desperately have a baby and I have been promiscuous and not use contraception, that is itself a moment that was like a terrifying point in the uh, time period. That was an additional level of like social mm. more that had gone on. I forgot to mention that, but because it was such a small character beat. Now, someone being promiscuous, you assume they would use a condom or be reasonable. But at the time it was even more scary and strange because people didn't know how easy it was to catch and there was no cure for that yet. And it's still not really a cure, well, but you know what I you mean. You know what? I'm going to give Chris a point for being old enough to <laughs> kind of really remember the AIDS <laughs> epidemic in a way that I can't. <laughs> uh, I kind of remember. I, I remember like I, syringes being I, I scary, mean, but like I'll, I'll safe accept, sex was like important, yeah. but not yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll accept I, I, that I and assume would, that it's it's not just the fact uh, that I'm parochial and obviously. old <laughs> listeners practice safe sex <laughs> um <laughs> uh it, it's it, i don't know i uh, i i think yeah you're right that the pill popping is sort of a side of the times too um because pharmaceutical technology or whatever was just about to become well, really much what I mean, it is today i think that's more relevant today than it was then oh i think so too it'd be opiates right i mean if they did this yeah. today it would be opiates tomorrow yeah. i mean like it's oh, happening right we've been now watching, i mean know. well it's this also is the, a slight side tangent go ahead Zach. uh shannon and i just started a sh- mini series on netflix starring anya taylor joy from the vivich and emma called yeah. the queen's gambit Written by uh, Walter Tevis, same uh, same author who wrote The Hustler, my favorite movie. We watched the first episode, and and there's a there's a a subplot that's already very prominent about these tranquilizers that uh, they force fed kids back in the day that she became quickly addicted to, and it it's a great show if you're interested in uh, watching a miniseries on Netflix. I think it has a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes, so. <laughs> You know, check out the Queen's that's, Gambit. That's really that. they've been trying to make Queen's Gambit for a while because he wrote that book a while ago. Um, but I'll watch it. it. I've, I've seen a lot of series to get the detention that it needs. I've seen a lot of people get excited about that one on Twitter. I haven't seen it, but since you say it's good, I'll give that one a shot. I like her in uh, everything she's done so far. Um, I think she's supposed to be doing a Furiosa like prequel. Well, I was just wondering if the pill popping is still as shocking as it used to be or if you guys think it might have shifted culturally because at the time period people were taking uppers a lot and they kind of viewed it as a a bad thing like people were doing cocaine and things like that and then years later i'm now in la and i found that people don't commonly use cocaine or uppers in the same way however the acceptance of uh, Adderall and Ritalin abuse seems to be far more widespread. I was wondering how you guys kind of felt on that. If it's still as much of a as much of a trigger more for drug abuse now as it used to be. I uh, well, I mean, I like I said, I think that opiates have uh, have kind of like the, the opiate abuse, especially like the Midwest and the Rust Belt, uh, is very prevalent. Especially in Colorado, it seems like they get pretty hit pretty bad. Especially in my hometown, Pueblo. Uh, and that has more to do with just overprescribing and 
you know, then it becomes very easy to get on. I think that that what the concern is for pill pop back then, I, I don't think Ritalin or or Adderall are as potent as the drugs that Beverly and Elliot were taking those barbiturates back yeah. then. I, mm-hmm. I don't think that they were as potent. So I think I think this is I think Russell's exactly right. Uh, I think that for uh, once. at the you know what? Fuck it. You get a point, Russell, for being exactly right. Uh, I've already spent two of my points. Sorry, guys. I'm, okay, I'm in a given one. mood. You fucking Ebenezer Scrooges ain't giving out shit. Yeah. So somebody's well, I mean, got to do it. Well, I had to ask uh, a question dumb enough that it would cause Russell to be correct. And so that I would. Oh, uh, thank give you, him buddy. Thanks, so, yeah. buddy. Yeah, yeah. Thank Here's you, buddy. what I. It goes around. Here's what I think. Listen, this was the 80s. This was. Uh, God. A different culture in certain ways. Um, the war on drugs was at its prime. Illegal drugs, even marijuana, were seen as toxic sort of tumors on society. Yeah. Whereas prescription drugs were seen as fair and fine and balanced. And now in 2020, you look at what really is causing problems, and it's not, frankly, it's not marijuana. It's not even really crack. It's it's prescription drugs. It's Oxycontin. And uh, uh, what's the other one? The P one. Uh, Percocet. Uh, I'm blanking. Percocet. Percocet. Yeah. Things like that that are causing the most intense drug addictions in the world. And there are things like Adderall and Ritalin that are comparatively minor. But I, I, th- I think that nowadays... Pill drug abuse is scarier to me than maybe even heroin abuse because well, it's so it's, much it's, more it's, easy and it's how it's it's so much more prevalent. Yeah. And, and, and it's also you can accidentally get into it due to someone who's trusted otherwise. Like you wouldn't expect to get something exactly. good from a street hustler. Right. But you would expect right. to get something healthy from and a doctor. Even if you do need it, even if you do need it for pain, mm-hmm. you do need it for pain. Let me say briefly: you be able to board that prescription eventually. My dad, this is America. My dad, it is very easy to get to heroin from my there. Dad, I mean, heroin, heroin will do the same job, and it's cheaper. My dad earlier this year had a situation where he fell down stair, the stairs and broke like nine ribs. And or he broke like six ribs, but there were nine fractures. Jesus. And he was on that stuff. And like I was worried. It seemed like he would recover from the injury, but I was worried about the the prescription drugs. And thank God, like it's been a number of months now. And it seems like he had the same thought like this stuff. I don't want to yeah. fuck around with. He just yeah. wanted to go back to his martinis as soon as possible. Um, fine yeah, with right. me. Yeah, right. much better than oxycotton or Percocet. Yeah, and that's why I mean it's it's ridiculous. Marijuana in a federal level is still considered a class one narcotic. That's yeah. insane to me. So that's, mm-hmm. that's insane to, me, to me. I think the idea of pills is scarier now than it was when this movie came out. Yeah, and I think just because even though the direction of the high than these barbecuing, this is where now the opiates are essentially heroin. Um, and again, it starts that cycle where anyway, I, I, I've always wondered that. And that's why I just stick to weed kids. You know, it's much easier, cheaper and you can, relatively harmless. You can dabble in mushrooms. Yeah, that's not true. Uh, that's not a very, 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 yeah. I highly recommend that. Yeah. Highly recommend yeah. that. And I mean, I'm, you I'm know, not going to, I'm not going to tell anybody to do anything illegal, but I will say that if you uh, want to go down an interesting internet rabbit hole, you should look up. Uncle Ben's on Reddit because it is a mushroom horticulturalist uh, subreddit, but it's entertaining because it got the name Uncle Ben's because somebody figured out that boiled rice in a bag is the perfect substrate to grow uh, mycelium that uh, eventually mm. turns into something you break up and then turn into mushrooms. So yeah, it's fascinating. Mm. It's a wonder drug. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, well, I it, don't, we don't uh, endorse. It, yeah, I don't the, endorse no, drug use. Nothing no, is endorsed. No, no. Bill uh, Barr, if you're listening. 
I, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to. Actually, first of all, Bill Barr, if you're listening, point one, fuck you. I hope you <laughs> right. Like, yeah, die and in point a fire. two, point two, you're but probably unemployed. Yeah, also, point, two, unemployed. Uh, point three, your bagpipe your playing's kind of bullshit, mon frere. Yeah. Yeah, and point four, we uh, we are not involved in growing illegal drugs. No, we're no. not. I, if you're not, I would probably have a lot more bit money in my bank account. Um, I think that that's verifiable that I'm not selling drugs. But um, I guess I guess we could go on to final thoughts on this since we do have some business to take care of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, let's do it. Yeah, I I think that um, yeah, it's a difficult movie. It's a difficult movie to watch. Yeah. Um, because not just that the 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 worksmanship that you have to do to kind of keep track who's to at the beginning, but also the subject matter and the way it's portrayed, because it's not entirely, you know that Beverly is going downhill, but the rate of which he goes downhill and then to snare up his twin brother uh, can, can be alarming, but it's satisfying. The ending is if not very tragic. Um, it, it highlights the tragedy of the whole situation rather than relying on thrilling you with what happened, even with the pills and the, the brutal murder at the end. Um, Irons obviously shines. I mean, he shines in this movie. Um, and if, for the 80s, considering the output, I mean, it's right before Naked Lunch, but a very mature outing for David Cronenberg. I thought that this was a, a very mature, tragic movie that had enough of that Cronenberg flair that, that he had that stamp on without getting off into what he's pretty comfortable with doing, which is, you know, I don't want to call it gore whore, but you guys know what I mean. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm going to go next. Um, I agree. I think this performance from irons, if I'm being honest with myself, I think it deserved like even Oscar consideration. Like I Uh, think it's so good. You just got yourself a point, buddy, because I was waiting for somebody to say Jeremy Irons has earned an Oscar for this movie, so it's, you win. It's maybe his strongest performance in his whole career. I haven't seen anything better from him, and I think he's a very strong actor regularly. Um, and it's a lot of other things at their best. I think it's the 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 terror of addiction without the melodrama that is presented by Requiem for a Dream. I think as I get older, Requiem for a Dream gets weaker because the way they present it is so over the top and melodramatic and Aronofsky is just like that. I don't think this movie is quite like that. I think that there are things that are exaggerated still, but uh, it's better in that way. And I, I, I also think, not to sound like a dare officer of course but you know there are genuine risks to drug addiction um but uh, i also think that it's cronenberg at a little bit of a held back like not going too over the top i just think that there is a lot to be said about this movie in terms of mediating yourself moderating yourself and i think that that's where this movie succeeds even if it has flaws, and I think it does, there might be pacing flaws or things like that. But I think I think there's a lot to praise in 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 those moments, and and it stuck with me for for 15 years, and it's going to stick with me probably for another 15 at least. And and I think that assuming I live that long, uh, and that's why. Um, I'd agree with uh, a lot of that. Um. My feelings on it are that it is a very, very influential film. Um, a lot of films after this kind of take uh, medical thrillers, uh, borrow from this, some of the ways in which things are uh, presented. Um, also, like I said, the uh, Saska, tr- the Saska sisters uh, and those twins have obviously been heavily, heavily influenced by Cronenberg. I actually remembered midway through this that they also did a uh, adaptation of Rabid. Uh, which is a remake of a Cronenberg film. Um, they also did See No Evil 2, so they are at the start of their careers, and it's not all bulletproof. <laughs> hey That's man, all I'm going to say. Take the jobs hey, you can hey, get. Hey, Especially if you're, no judge. Yeah. if you're female directors in Hollywood, hey man, no judge. And, and, yeah. and they're calling you, you answer that phone call. But you know. the thing I will say is they've uh, definitely, definitely uh, are awesome as far as American Mary was concerned. They also made a, a uh, critically acclaimed horror film that was really low budget. I haven't seen it called Dead Hooker in a Trunk. 
Um, <laughs> Love the title. <laughs> that's exactly the read. Like the Sasuke, the Sasuke sisters are fun to follow in general. Uh, they have sort of a personality that comes out uh, on their social media that is sort of a similar presentation to like how Alfred Hitchcock would have a personality he puts out publicly. So when you watch a movie of theirs, it sort of has their cultural cachet brought with it. So it's not just watching, you know, the horror film. It'll be a horror film by the Sasuke sisters. So it's got an extra twist to it. Um, I would suggest anybody go watch American Mary. If um, if you like Dead Ringers, but you want to see something that is a little bit more uh, viscerally shocking uh, and on and, screen. Uh, and we also mentioned Catherine Isabel stars in that. If you've mm-hmm. seen Ginger Snaps, which I think exactly. is a Halloween classic, in mm-hmm. my opinion, it's the same lead actress. Um, and uh, yeah, so that'd be one I would suggest if you like this, go seek that out. The one thing with Dead Ringers that I do remember is just how cold it is. It has certain moments mm. of warmth that happen at the very beginning of the movie, but for the most part, it feels very clinical. Um, it's interesting because hmm. it is a movie about being in a doctor's office for extremely personal and extremely potentially emotionally scarring things. Like I'd imagine going into a gynecologist as about the same level of discomfort that comes up when I, for example, would go to a urologist or something like that. Where you're dealing with something very personal with a stranger who is uh, probably more so, I would I would argue. Uh, yeah, but you're dealing with a very personal thing with a very uh, new person. It's a stranger. It's an academically informed stranger. So um, to me, it's always been interesting to watch this. But I also really, really beyond Jeremy Irons, I really like the performance of Genevieve Bajold. Um, she is a yeah. actress. We didn't for talk sure. about her enough. She's for sure. We did not give her enough oxygen that she very deserved. Yeah, she's a fascinating actress. She almost um, played uh, uh, Jane, uh, the Commander Jane on Voyager. I think that was the uh, the main commander's name. Janeway. Janeway. Yeah, she almost played Janeway. She yeah, played Janeway. She oh, played, okay. She played Janeway for one episode, and then there was some sort of a creative um, mix up, and they decided to not have her play it, and they went with uh, uh, not Gates McFadden, but the actress who eventually played Janeway. Um, yeah. Um, but this actress has had kind of a fascinating career. So um, outside the context of this, she's always kind of fun when she appears in things. At least I like her as an actress. So. Um, yeah, I would say this is definitely worth your time. Um, it leaves you uneasy and uncomfortable after you get done watching it, which is, I think, what all thrillers and Sticks particularly horror films oh, should. Yeah. yeah, it's got a lot of meat on the bones, <laughs> and uh, it'll definitely stick with you. So, yeah, I would advise anyone go see this. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, with, it's satisfying without really kind of making it a satisfying ending but you as an audience member felt like well that that didn't waste my time you know and it's not annoying so yeah yeah i i would recommend it and weird obviously. movie to watch though weird movie i would mm-hmm. caveat on that it's a very strange yeah. movie it's an intense one you know you got to be in the right mood yeah for sure and i forced these folks to watch it whether That's they right. were in the right mood or not <laughs> <laughs> knowing that russell is a twin especially That's right. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um yeah yeah right and i i now thanks zach now i have to go to therapy uh, yeah. so we tried to get his twin on this episode it didn't quite work out yeah, yeah. Quite hopefully work out, hopefully yeah, we will see. get the the richard carlson on here soon that's right yeah um, but uh, the, there's two of me uh-huh um, so I guess with that in mind, I'll run down the points real quick. Uh, each of us have 10 points to divvy up, but we have gained a point each. Zach Powers gained a point from me, uh, because he mentioned Jeremy Irons not getting an Oscar for this movie. Uh, I got a point for being right for once on the topic of drugs. And Zach and Chris got a point, uh, simply by living through the AIDS epidemic. He survived <laughs> it. We're proud of him. We sure it was a or tough time. Having a better know. memory right. than the rest yeah. of us. Yeah. Yeah. I would it. say yeah. that, yeah. Um, he got an A. It's basically an A. It's social security points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's essentially it. Yes, I'm old enough to have had to have an HIV test at one point in time where the concern was it might come back positive. It didn't. I'm very yeah. lucky. I have so, one remaining to give out. Uh, I can't. Did uh, Russell, you gave me? I gave you my- a point and Chris. So Chris and I have a point, two points each to give out through the 
crest of the round, which is uh, actors in multiple roles. Oh, no, I think um, that's incorrect. I think I have one point to You have to one give point, out. and Chris and I have two points left to oh, divvy out. You both gave out a point. We both gave out a Oh, no, Chris didn't give out a point. No, I did give out a point. I gave you a point, good sir, for being... Uh, oh, I thought I that was Zach, so I got two. Did I? Well, I guess you, no, I don't think you, you gave got, a point. I didn't write it down. If you wrote it down, it, I, I don't you think a, you gave out a uh, point, Chris. Okay, well, then I didn't give out any points. I got two that All I got to right, give so away. Chris, Chris has three. Time. You have three points three. that you could give away. Russell has two, and I have one. Great googly right. moogly. And, and you can choose to divvy up those points on the next round of this theme, which that ball is in Chris Borf's court. So, yeah, Borf, Chris, you have the what next are we doing? tool or more multi-rolls. Yes, so... Could be two, could be more than two. The Multiple roles, one paycheck. The common thing, as the theme has often been with me, is me fighting against the tide. Uh, coming up with an idea and suggesting it Listen, to clear... If and you say fucking Tootsie like you suggested, <laughs> like, <laughs> veto, you'll watch it. We've you'll gone over it. this, Chris. We've you have, over this. You have, you will you have gone in, yes. but at the end of the round... I'm vetoing, my friend. Yes. Yeah. So as everyone can now see, this has been an ongoing conversation with winners and losers on many sides. But in the interest of compromise in this season of uncertainty in politics, I have found a oh, film please. in which one actor plays multiple parts that I believe fits this correctly, and it's not a total con. I would like to suggest we watch Enemy, the Dennis Villavoe film, because I've never seen it, and it's got two Gyllenhaals in it. I've never seen it either. It is one of those films that Enemy. has often been suggested. I've People have good things. commented. Good things. Dennis Villeneuve, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I believe it came out against another film that was also the same actor playing two parts as twins in a city. I don't exactly know what this film's about. I've heard it's surreal, I've heard it's weird, but I'd like to see it, and uh, I decided to go with the random unknown to see what happens. Hey, it worked out for me before, so maybe it'll work out for you. I, uh, and, and sometimes going with the known known blows up in your face like Police Academy. I'm never gonna live that one down. <laughs> um, no, that okay, was so fun. I think occasionally, I think Wolver, occasionally, right? I mean, we're, we're waiting for I think a, occasionally you've got to be the agent of chaos who puts a bomb in front I of everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and it really depended on what Borf. Now, I, I'm not sure if I'll get to be my, the, 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 the court gesture here for this round since Borf didn't pick the movie I thought he was gonna... Um, so well, I'll have to rethink that multiplicity, strategy, that's for another time. Multiplicity was so high on my goddamn <sighs> list. So high. Until I saw and a trailer for it. That would actually be it. an interesting one compared... Have you never seen it? No, I haven't it, seen it. But the thing is, is I saw the, the trailer. Okay. And I've seen something that was based off of it. I saw House Are of Cosby. Are we Cosby's. still in the episode right now? Yeah, uh, yeah we can say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, uh, I'm going to say this has been Chris Boroff signing off. I'll see you guys next week when we watch, uh, Enemy. Enemy. Uh, I am Ben Russell Carlson. Thank you very much for listening. Gentlemen, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And I have been Zach Powers, again, your host with the second or third most. And we'll see you in two weeks. We've got to take a shot of Dinatil tonight. Otherwise, we might converse. Right. Don't forget. Right. Then we go to Perkadan in the morning. Mm. Right. Then in the afternoon, we have a little treat. I lauded just because it's Saturday. So on Monday we kick, right? If we agreed, we have to start to pull things back together then. Oh, yes. On Monday we definitely kick. Have us some cake? <laughs>